So quick question. Who here likes unreliable data stores? Right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> there you go. So I go riding with a lot of guys. This is me there on the right. Uh, we go up riding on the quads, and uh, there's like two or three families and friends. And of course, there's a lot of guys that are always like, I got to be the fastest. And they work on their quads, and they do all kinds of performance stuff. And then I've got me, and you'll see that kind of purple thing on the front. That's a toe strap. So I work with the vendors of all the performance stuff to make sure that I'm super reliable. So I've got these guys that are up there, and we'll race up hills, and they usually beat me a little bit. But then I get up to the hill, and I'm like, hey, you need me to tow you back down? Because I've stayed and focused on reliability. And that's our focus today, is to make sure that you get the best practices to stay reliable. Because you can have all the performance you want, but if it's not going to keep you going, it's no good. So focus on reliability, keep the reliability, you'll end up with some performance. Yeah, and a point too, right, is that um, obviously we can't mention every best practice out there on the planet, yeah. right? Because every vendor has different recommendations. Every storage platform is slightly different, right? And so certain places we're just going to call out, you know what, you have to ask your vendor about this. But what we're going to try to do is explain some of these common things that we see and give some context to some of these important settings that some recommend to change and some do not. And then you can either make your own decision about it or, once again, talk to your vendor. All right, yeah. And I mean, any one of these subjects in this session could be an entire session easily, easily. So one of the premises that we did with this session, um, kind of a quick agenda here, and that's quite a bit of stuff, so we're going to try and get through it. I talked to GSS, and I said, what are the most common problems you guys see? What is it like number one, top five, whatever it might be? They sent me a huge list. So what I did is I went through that and picked out some of the most common ones that we hear as problem points. Number one is iSCSI. And this was a substantial difference between everything else. iSCSI just, apparently people just mess it up. Next was fiber channel. Similar, right, we're talking block storage, but you know, pathing, zoning, that type of thing, usually some type of misconfiguration. That was another thing that was very high on their list. Another thing was queuing. Cody's gonna talk quite a bit about this. Um, you hear different people talk about, oh, you need to change this setting, you need to change this setting, or make this, that, that setting, and this one that, and it's, sometimes there's no context around that. So it's like, well, why do I set that? Why would I change that value? And if I change that value, what does it get me? Am I gaining anything with that? Am I increasing performance? Am I possibly changing some reliability? So that's where we talk about that piece. NAS, typically NAS is always networking. There are some other settings within ESX. A lot of times, again, very much the vendor setting. They might say, you know, we want to change this value, do this. There could be some inconsistencies across hosts. Maybe they don't have their target set up right for, again, the network. With all of that, we end up with latency problems, we end up with performance problems, and we end up with reliability. So again, reliability being the key piece here. So I'm gonna hand over to Cody. Cody's gonna jump into some, the PSA stack, which is, hopefully everybody understands what that is. We'll go quick overview on that. Yeah, so I mean, this whole stack, once again, like you said, we could talk about every piece of this for the now until next VM world, right, in this room. And, but we're gonna try to just focus on a, a core portion of the, the stack, right? So I mean, there's multi-pathing, there's the vSCSI layer, there's PSA, IO scheduling, all that type of stuff. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna mainly focus at this section here, right? Because this is where most of the questions come up. This is where most of the settings that get recommended in storage vendor best practice documents and things like that come from, and this is where most of the conversation comes up. These, these are where, when I've been at the booth this week, most of the questions I've been getting have been around this spot. So first off, let's talk a little bit about multipath and configuration, because right? this is generally the first question that someone's gonna ask, especially if they're implementing a new storage platform. Right? So there are what they call SATPs, storage array type plugins. This essentially describes how a certain array is going to be claimed and configured by default inside of ESX. Um, the default is usually the best option, 
right? So don't change it unless your storage vendor tells you to, right? This is something you definitely want to stick to what your storage vendor recommends. And there's, there's a fair amount of them. Um, <clears throat> There's some default ones in ESX, which is kind of standard T10 support, and then there's actually some that are specific for different array types that are built into ESX. And so pay attention to how that's set and how that's configured. And also pay attention to what actually is on your ESX, because you, you can create custom rules that can change the defaults, and you may or may not want that. That right? could have been around for years, and you might miss it. So it's important to check how that is actually configured. So you can create a new SATP rule, right, saying, hey, this, um, either this storage device configure this way, or this storage array, or this model, right, or vendor, rather, um, can be configured in this way. I want it to always be set to round robin with the I.O. operations limit set to one. Right, this is definitely what you want to do if the recommendation for your storage platform is not a default, right, to create this rule. That way, all the storage presented from that point in time for that model, that vendor, or even that NAA, right, whatever, is configured appropriately for the lifetime of that ESXi server. And so you can swap out, obviously, vendor and model with your appropriate vendor and model. And I think pretty much all vendors should have some documentation around setting this. And this, this configuration has been available since, I believe, ESX 5.0. So hopefully we're all there. I did get a question a couple months ago about 4.1 and threw up my mouth a little bit. But, um, <laughs> anyways, um, right, this, kidding, is, right? This, is, this is a big uh, follow vendor guidelines section. Um, now, above and beyond that, there's something called a PSP, right? The PSP is a path selection policy. And there are some default ones inside of ESX. Right? There's MRU, most recently used. It's basically the first path it sees is going to use that one right? until that one goes away for some reason. Fix is kind of a, a similar concept. And there's also round robin. Round robin is going to use all the paths in an active, active state. Um, and there's a variety of different PSPs, a variety of different SATPs, and different SATPs have different default PSPs. Right? So by setting a different default SATP for a certain array type, you might get a different PSP. You can also change the default PSP if you want to for that given SATP. Right? In the end, I would not recommend doing that. I would recommend just creating a rule for the storage platform you want. If it's not already in there. If it's not there already. There are a ton of claim rules in there. They call it, and the way the SATP goes through, right, or the NMP, excuse me, it's going through and looking and trying, it looks at HBAs, it looks at pathing, and then it looks at the destination ID, which would be the array. And it works its way through, and typically it will find one that matches that vendor or matches the path or whatever that might be. If it's not in there, that's where Cody's talking about. You may need to change something, and it may, again, please make sure that it's recommended by either the vendor or VMware. And when you do that, if you create your own custom claim rule, then you can be more consistent on when you go set that, right? Because you get one character wrong, you could have all kinds of problems, and there goes your reliability thing again. Yeah, I mean, like, um, at Pure, we didn't have a default one for the longest time, and I'd tell customers, change it, change it, change it, and then, you know, customer finally asked, like, have you asked VMware? I'm like, well, you know what, I haven't. So I pinged the product manager, he's like, sure, we'll add a default. So, you know, it happens, right? right. So talk to your vendors if the default doesn't exist, to have them ask VMware to do it, because VMware is very happy to add things in to make sure the storage is configured appropriately for that storage vendor, right? So they've been very responsive around that. You just have to ask, apparently, right? <laughs> so there are a couple options here. So here shows for, well, here's an example from Pure, right? It shows we have our default path selection policy, right, round robin, IO operations limit to one, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Uh, here's one from Nimble, right? They have their own custom, right, PSP that you can install from them that reacts to their storage and their paths in a custom and appropriate way, way, way for that array. All right, so this is, once again, like <clears throat> a lot of different options, a lot of different settings, a lot of different plugins. Talk to your vendor. I'm going to say that probably a thousand more times, but yeah, it's, it's important. It, the thing. key is make sure you're, you're figuring out what that best practice is because, you know, that nimble one is a round robin, but they change a little bit of the settings. So if you don't use that, you're not going to get best performance for that vendor. Now, with Pure and a lot of the other ones, we're just using the standard Lua, and that defaults usually to round robin. That's using the SCSI T10, which makes it very simple because then it doesn't have to be anything custom. And that's really where we're trying to go as well because by staying with that, then it's very consistent across different arrays if we can get to that T10 standard. And on, and on that note of custom and tuning, right, there is a setting that comes up quite a bit when talking about round robin. 
right? By default, round robin is going to send 1,000 IOs down a single path before moving to the next path for that given device. Right? Um, and this is generally fine. Right? Um, VMware has it as a default for a reason. Um, but most vendors recommend tuning this down to a minimum value of, of one. Right? I think there's a few that say like 10 or something sufficiently low. Um, the question is, should I? Is that the right thing to do? Is it not? Generally, um, you're not going to get a performance benefit from changing. I, I, I have never really quite proven that out, um, that you'll see much of a performance change from changing it to 1,001. The main reason that <clears throat> we recommend this is path fail over time. Um, we see paths fail over much more quickly when this is set sufficiently low inside of ESX, right? And so one is sufficiently low. Um, there is a slight CPU overhead from doing this a little more frequently, but generally CPUs are far more powerful these days than they were 10 years ago when you first argued about this, and that overhead is very insignificant to the benefit you get for path fail over time. So that is really the main reason that I think most vendors recommend changing this, right? And that's generally included in that default, like included in that SATP rule. Also, you'll see a better I.O. balance, right, across your front end of your array, and that's a nice thing to say. If I, hey, if I'm going to take a controller down or something, I want to make sure that it has paths to all my controllers or whatnot. And so that gives you a little bit of a comfort knowing that, yes, it is actively using all the available paths in a redundant fashion, right? So it's a nice way to kind of prove that out. So check it and make sure it's correct. And on that note, Hi, Scuzzy, my friend. All right, the number one problem. Uh, with the, the iSCSI, again, really check with your vendors. There's a lot of great docs. Got a ni nice little treat for everyone at the end of the presentation that'll help you with some of the information. Uh, networking. Obviously, iSCSI goes across the network. Make sure that you've got load balancing set up, you've got pathing set up, you've got all your initiators on all of your iSCSI adapters, and you also have all of those at your targets. This is that consistency piece. Make sure that where one configuration on one host is identical on the other, and that that also matches your targets. Port binding is best practice. I'm going to go actually into port binding. That's the number one problem with iSCSI that GSS gets, is port binding configuration. Inherently, somebody has messed that up. Load balancing, again, try and get your, all your initiators across to your hosts and make sure they're all consistent so that all your targets for all of your paths can be used. Redundancy, that seems kind of obvious, but again, making sure that you've got multiple paths to your storage array, multiple paths to your host. Storage. Now, there is a caveat on this. We don't want to obviously share LUNs outside of the virtual environment. Now, I'm going to say this because somebody's going to probably get me on it and say, oh, but what about RDMs? First of all, RDMs suck. Second, <laughs> an RDM is a very unique situation where that LUN possibly would be shared between a virtual and a physical. Generally, it's very, very small case, but that might be the only time that a LUN is shared outside of a virtual environment. Really what I'm talking about here is don't take a LUN for a data store and share it for some other function outside of your virtual environment. Might seem obvious, but we see it happen. Teaming or port binding. So like I said, teaming is best practice. Port binding gives you load balancing not only on NIC failover, but also on SCSI sense codes. So if you've got some issues within the path, port binding is actually capable of failing over even if the path itself is fine. So that's another one, number one reason why we want to use port binding in any of our iSCSI configurations. The other thing that you can look at is the load balancing across all of the paths you've set up. So for every SCSI initiator and SCSI software adapter, or independent or dependent, it will load balance across all of them. So you get that many to many, hopefully you've got many on your array, and so you get this inherent load balancing automatically across all of your initiators and all of your devices. Nick teaming. So I'm going to start off with the first is a lot of people thought about 6.0 and below, where you couldn't route 
with NIC team, or excuse me, port binding. But in general, that was the number one reason why you had to do NIC teaming, is if you had a storage target was separate or in a different zone or a different VLAN or different subnet than your virtual infrastructure. In 6.5, we made the change where instead of having to use NIC teaming, you can use port binding. So I can go into that in a little more detail. The first one here shows your virtual environment in one subnet, your storage target in another subnet. That's usually pretty easy because you only are really going across one route. Um, when you do that, it's, it's showing how we can do one gateway to get from one infrastructure to the other. That problem we were talking about just a minute ago, which was the NIC teaming, that used to require only NIC teaming because you were routing to a different network. In this example, you'll see we have hosts that are in different subnets, and we have target storage arrays that are in different subnets. So now, with 6.5 and above, you can do a per VM kernel gateway. So now you can actually use port binding with arrays that are on a different subnet, which is great, because port binding, again, is the best practice. This is some command line kind of showing that. And yeah, let's go back one here. So this shows you, and again, this kind of captures if you want to go in and see if you're doing this type of thing where you're doing routing. You want to try and avoid routing if you can, because anytime you add a hop, you're adding latency, you're adding more paths, right? We don't want to do that. You want to try and make your, your path as short as possible. But this is a way you can check that. Next, configuring your adapter. And I put in ICER because now with 6.7, iSCSI extensions for RDMA are supported with any of those iSCSI adapters. Now, you've got your software adapter. Software adapter can be used with any type of NIC. All right, so you can use it with, it doesn't have to be a specific type of NIC. Now, we do recommend 10 gig or above. Obviously, the more bandwidth you have, the more performance you get. Then you've got dependent adapters. When any, or independent adapters, I didn't capture that piece, but dependent or independent, those do require that you have to bind that to the kernel. You can't, so be careful if you do have a dependent or an independent iSCSI adapter, don't bind it to your regular NIC. Make sure you're aware it has to go to that correct NIC. Otherwise, you're not gonna get the additional performance benefits, which is really just lower CPU iSCSI software now can get almost line rate at 10 gig. So there are some that really like to dedicate 100% the hardware, and they might go with dependent or independent adapters. Now, when you're using ICER, and you're doing any type of RDMA over iSCSI, that is obviously very specific. That has to be bound to that controller only for the RDMA protocol to be able to use and go across hosts to whatever the target might be. And the target obviously has to have an RDMA capable device. When we're configuring multiple adapters for ICER um, or iSCSI, typically this is a really popular way to do it. One of the things that when you do it this way, you end up with kind of, you might end up with switch sprawl, especially if you've got extra NICs that you're doing to dedicate towards your iSCSI environment. So another way that you can do is, and it, it says that it's not supported because it, this early document was showing NIC teaming. But if you do a single switch, which is supported, the key is that if we looked at the VMK1 is tied to NIC1 only, and it is not, it's an explicit attachment. It is not a failover. You do not put anything in there as a standby, Active passive, it's one NIC to one kernel, and it's explicit only. You do not, the failover happens within the protocol itself. So that's something you're, somebody might be used to, say, uh, like vMotion, where you do active one, passive on the other. Do not do that with iSCSI. It's explicit, one NIC, one kernel only. So that shows NIC teaming there, 
But like I said, if you do it with the explicit kernel to HBA, or excuse me, NIC, not HBA, uh, it will work. The NIC teaming does not work for ICER. Hopefully you're not doing that, because if you're routing that far on ICER, you're kind of killing the whole point of getting the performance for RDMA, right? So, VMFS. All righty. <clears throat> Best did you have anything else on the ICER? I forgot to. Actually, hurt. there was one thing I did forget about the multipathing thing. So I, I, um, there was something subtly released um, in oh, 6.7 yes. right. update one um, that's coming out pretty soon when it comes to multipathing. So there is a new path selection policy um, that VMware has been testing out for some time, and it's latency based. All right. So it'll it'll look at the active queue. It'll look at the latency of a given path and decide to use it or not to use it. Right. Yeah. So I published that on Storage Hub. It's under the 6.7 at the very bottom. It says new load balancing round robin. I'm going to be doing a blog on it that shows more specifically why you would set one way or the other. The idea of this new load balancing round robin is that it actually samples I.O. and time to get what they call an I.O. wait time. And so what it can do is, like Cody was talking earlier about the pathing and the depth of the queues, this looks at the entire path, not just like what's my destination wait time. This looks at the path itself. So it calculates based on those values and then reroutes it. The other thing that's nice about this new round robin is it's tunable. So I can say like the default is 16 IO for a sample window and then it's uh, 15 seconds I believe. And you can tune those and say I want it longer or I want it shorter. So what it'll do the sample, read it, redirect I.O., and then it waits for a certain amount of time, and then it re-samples. So this is more active in the load balancing, and we've seen some pretty incredible benefits where we've increased latency up to 100 milliseconds on all the paths, and it always picked the fastest path. Yeah, and our, our, testing, our testing so far, like if you just set it in a normal, healthy environment, probably not going to see a difference, right. right? But when you do start running into problems, you do have some path with some bad latency or whatever, right? It does seem to have pretty significant impact. So the best practice around here is ask your vendor to test it and let you know if they want you to use it. Yeah, it was just released, so you know vendors are yeah. really haven't they're testing it, so it's not a here's the value we we'll want to set. Everybody's trying to figure out, okay, what what would work for this vendor in this setup? So FYI. Yeah. All right, so VMFS, um, use VVols and just move on. Is that good? Yeah, so, that's it. Just right, use VVols. So, uh, <laughs> I have a VVOL session at 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. Uh, anyways, um, VMFS 3, 5, 6, right? You should get off 3. If you move to 6.7, VMware forces you to get off of VMFS 3. It actually auto-upgrades it to 5, right? So if you do have any of those lingering around you might, before you upgrade, you know, might as well upgrade those now. Um, VMFS 5 is, is certainly great, but there's a lot of enhancements in VMFS 6, right? A, a primary one is automatic unmap, and we'll, we'll touch on that briefly in a bit here. Uh, we do encourage customers to, VMFS, to move to VMFS 6 if they are on the latest release, right? Six, well, 6.5 or later. Um, the one note about that is it is not upgradable from VMFS 5 to 6. You do need to create new data stores and move over. VMware had made a lot of metadata management changes inside the file system, and it was just the better option to do that. So for better, for worse, you get some benefits, but there is a process to get to it, um, which is why if you're moving storage in motion, you might as well storage in motion to be false, right? right. Yeah, the block size change becomes much more efficient file system, so trying to do a, a shuffle upgrade just doesn't really work that well. Yeah. It's better right. to just start new. That way when your VMs come over there, they get the new block size, it becomes more efficient, especially with SE sparse. Yeah. Data store extents um, are evil, in my opinion. Um, do not do them. Um, if you can, if you need to add capacity, increase the size of the existing extent and then do a VMFS volume grow or create another data store. Um, extents in general just make management more complex, right? What volumes are connected? Are, do I connect the right volumes at the right time to the right hosts, right? There's complexity involved there and it generally causes more problems than it could potentially solve around some performance benefits, right? If you need to do concatenation, do it on the array side because some arrays will do that. And then, we try to take questions at the end just because we have a lot of content, but we'll, that, I'll make sure I can talk to you afterwards. 
All right, storage DRS, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, but this is one way to, nice to, to manage uh, capacity, right? If, if your array can't have large data stores and you do have some capacity limits around that, storage DRS is a nice way to balance across those different multiple data stores if you do need to introduce multiple data stores instead of larger, fewer data stores. Okay. Inside of data store clusters, unless you're doing some kind of migration scenario, try to keep those data stores homogenous across the type of disk or flash or whatever, or array or model, right? Make sure that storage DRS is not moving your VMs from completely different types of storage. That's just a general best practice around managing it. Now, what about all the other questions around VMFS? Right? How, how big should I make it? How many VMs should I put on it? Right, what are the performance characteristics of it? Um, and a lot of this is very array specific. Right? Um, how, big, how big does your array support volumes? Right? Uh, what is the performance profile of a volume on that array? How many VMs do they recommend? Right? These, these aren't really, it depends on the array if there's a performance question or not. And I'll talk a little bit more about queuing towards the end. And that's really what that question comes down to from performance. Yeah. But from a configuration standpoint is what features are you using? Right? Do you want to replicate these VMs? Well, that data store, if you're using array-based replication, the whole thing's going to be replicated. Right, if you're using array-based snapshots and you want a certain level of granularity of restore, right, there's another question. But that still doesn't really inform how big the data store is. That's really more about how many VMs you put on it. Right? And then that, of course, then comes down to the performance. And I'll as I said, I'll talk about queuing and around that. But these are really questions that you want to ask. One thing that's really important is does your array vendor support VAAI? Right, X copy, especially atomic test and set, yeah. right, the, hard the hardware-assisted locking mechanism. This really informs that question, those questions. Right? If they do not support ATS, you're going to run into performance problems at scale with those virtual machines, because SCSI reservations will lock out I.O. when they're taken from other hosts, and that can cause performance problems. That's why, for the longest time, right, VMFS was stuck at two terabytes, because there's just no point of going larger than that, for the most part. Right? And so that's a really important question. Does your volume on the right, does it have a performance limit? Right. Is there, uh, whether that be artificially set, right, through some kind of QoS or something like that? Um, or is there just, it's tied to a certain number of spindles or whatnot? Right. That's another question you need to ask. Right. Is there a, a certain performance limit on that volume? In that case, that's when you maybe need to parallelize your data stores or stick them to a certain size. Right. In the end, it's really about features I plan on using right, from an array perspective. Right. And the... Um, the support around VAI. Right? That, that's really what informs whether or not I should use large data stores or not. Okay. So, <clears throat> with that note, I said I'll come back to queuing and performance configuration around VMFS and RDMs in a bit, but let's talk about NFS first. All right, thanks. So, NFS, do not mix clients. What I mean by this is on a specific single data store, don't mix one host mount with v3 and one host mount with v1. You'd think they should be compatible. They're not. They'll cause all kinds of... They, the way they interact with the file system is different. And if you mix those, you're going to end up with lots of problems. In fact, a lot of times we've even possibly seen data loss. So do not mix clients for a single data store. You can mix clients within an infrastructure, but not per data store. So just keep that in mind when you're going to mount your NFS system. This is something that, I'm gonna kind of work on this internally, but there is no NFS specific kernel that you can choose, but this doesn't stop you from creating one. I used to always create, and I still do, create an individual kernel for my VMS traffic. Now, most people just default and leave it to the management kernel, VMK0, Problem is, is if your VMK0, your management kernel, is not on the same subnet as your storage array, now you're routing, you're adding latency, you're reducing performance. Just create a new kernel, name it NFS, and then all your NFS traffic, right, it's gonna pick the path that doesn't route. So now you've reduced those hops and you're gonna get better performance. NFS v3 and v4 are supported. Both support the OS security. With NFS v4, we have Kerberos, and we also Kerberos with data integrity. So that's an option if maybe you have some additional security that you need. So you can use NFS v4 to get that additional security for data integrity. Multipathing, recommended again if you're using NFS v4 
again, be consistent. Make sure you're using that across your environment. Because if you go in and set up multipathing for NFS v4 and try and use v3, it's not going to work. You're going to have a huge problem. 10 gig is always recommended, especially with NFS. It also kind of applies to Kent, um, iSCSI. The more bandwidth to ha you have, the more performance you're going to get, and also the lower latency. Uh, more throughput, more performance. Minimize latency by, again, minimize those hops and make sure you've got enough bandwidth. If you don't have 10 gig and you do have 1 gig, add some additional cards that are dedicated for that, path, for that storage traffic. That way you're, you're, kinda, you're getting rid of that contention or that possible contention with other traffic in your environment. Advanced configs. So this goes back to the storage vendor specific stuff. Typically, especially with NFS, some vendors say, I want you to change the TCP heap size or number of max volumes. The key to these, again, follow best, vendor's best practices, but make sure it's consistent across every single host. If you don't do that, again, you're going back to that reliability problem. Do you want super performance on one host or do you want reliability and consistency on all of the hosts. One thing I wanted to talk really quick, let me go back one. Um, there's a lot of questions about jumbo frames, iSCSI, NFS. Here's our recommendation, or here's my recommendation. <laughs> if you have jumbo frames, then use jumbo frames. If you do not have jumbo frames, don't use jumbo frames. It is not worth the <laughs> headache to set this up. Trust me. I've seen more support escalations of not setting it through and through the stack than, than happy stories of it improving performance. It will give like you By an order of many magnitudes. Yeah. It will give you a performance increase. It's not much. Most of the time, most people don't need it. But what we see is that if an infrastructure or a company is not used to using jumbo frames, and they're like, well, I was told to use jumbo frames. I just had a call the other day. I tried to enable jumbo frames, and I lost connectivity. Did you do it on every single thing? Well, no. It has to be end-to-end, -end, every single point in that path. And so if you don't use jumbo frames, don't go in and enable jumbo frames. Please. It's just you're ending up with some port call. So with that, we'll jump over to uh, Vvols, our you favorite. Totally read my mind about the jumbo frames thing. Yeah, Joe reminded me that was great because that's it is jumbo frames. Everybody's like, well, it said to use them because it is the best practice. It needs to be a caveat only if you already got it. I mean, honestly, like in the end, the whole recommendation here is consistency, right? Even if it's consistently stupid, I think I'd rather that than inconsistent, right? Because right. at least it's easier to predict and understand yeah. how things are going on or go what's happening. I right? set this on every host. Well, you were consistent, at least. I like that, right? <laughs> so yeah, VVOLS, right? Um, so I won't spend a lot of time on this, right? There's a lot of other sessions and things like that. Um, but it, it is important because it has been coming up quite a bit to understand it. Because it is very different than what you're used to. From a VMware layer, things are actually very similar, right? Yeah. You see your VMs, you have your virtual disks, you had things, just snapshot and so forth. But what's happening underneath is, of course, very, very different, right? You have virtual disk files, there are VMDKs, there are VMX files, right, describing your VMs, there's a folder for it, right, but these are all pointers, right, just like a physical mode RDM, it has a VMDK pointer, and it's the same thing with VVOLs, right, so when you add a virtual disk to a VVOL-based VM, right, it goes to the array and creates that 100 gig virtual volume, that volume on the array, right, if you resize it from VMware, it resizes it to 200 gigs or a terabyte or whatever, if you delete it from VMware, um, you delete it from the array. There was an interesting Twitter conversation a couple days ago. Um, I think I tweeted something about stickers, and it turned into RDMs somehow. And um, someone said, there's really, when you look at it, there's no better storage mechanism for VMware other than well-orchestrated RDMs. And I'm like, well, my friend, that's exactly what VVOLS is, <laughs> if you really look at it. It's a well-orchestrated RDM layer. Right? But you don't have the downsides of RDMs, because it still uses go through the vSCSI layer. You can snapshot, you can clone, storage motion but also has the benefits of it, right? It's a direct volume. Okay. And so these objects are described on the array um, by a variety of different uh, volumes, right? So a VM has a configuration volume, four gigs in size, and then a number of volumes that are its virtual disks, and then snapshots and so forth. 
Right. Now, of course, it, VVOLs is also supported on NFS, and it is a slightly different mechanism there, right? Because they're not going to be volumes, they'll still be somewhat files, but it really enjoys both NFS and Block for VVOLs support, supports that storage policy based management layer. Right. I need this VM, I need this virtual disk to be replicated, I want this to be snapshotted, I want this virtual disk to have a QoS setting from the array. All right. So it brings that intelligence of the array into VMware, right? And gives the array much more insight into the VMware environment, all right? So <clears throat> beyond SPBM, um, a uh, interesting thing that comes up here is uh, data stores, right? If there is no more VMFS, if there's no more like NFS data store, what happens to the VVOLs? What do I put my VM on when I'm provisioning with PowerCLI, right? New dash VM dash VM dash name dash data store. What goes there? All right, so there still is a data store. Because right? a data store, a VMFS or NFS or whatever, is a couple things, right? It's a management object, it's a capacity quota, and it's also a data path, right? VMFS is all those things together. VVOLS has split those things out so you can manage things independently. Right? They're disconnected the performance, the connectivity layer from the, the data store itself. They've disconnected the configuration from the data store. Right? You can individually configure your VMs and your virtual disks. So what is a, da a VVOL data store? Well, it's a capacity quota. It's not a file system, right? It's a capacity quota. And this can be anything. Um, I mean, literally, I'm from, maybe not literally. The maximum size is 16 zettabytes, right? Which I think is the amount of capacity on Earth right now or something like that. So quite a bit. Right? Well, set to zero, actually, it's infinite, so. Um, it's also a target for provisioning, right? Hey, I want this VM to be on this array. All right, I'll choose a VVOL data store from that array, and it'll create my VM and its volumes on that particular array. And a VVOL data store is a collection of those config VVOLs, right? So when you browse on that VVOL data store, you'll see your folders, and then you go into that folder, and you'll see your files. When you go from one folder to another folder, you're just moving from one config VVOL to another, but that's transparent to the end user. It looks like you're traversing a file system, but you're actually moving between those different config VVOLs. What a VVOL data store is not. It is not a file system. It is not a LUN. It is not a physical device or volume or whatever you refers to it as. Right, so this is an important mechanism. Performance is not tied to a VVOL data store. Right, other than, you know, whatever array it represents, that's the amount of performance you could get potentially from that VVOL data store. And so the questions that you generally ask around VMFS, even NFS, performance, size, the, the answers are mean very different things. It has nothing to do with configurations of your VMs. It has nothing to do with the performance profile of those VMs. Right? It's really about a capacity quota. You can provision five petabytes from that array, whatever. Right? And a cool thing around best practices, I'm very happy to say this, you can now use VMware snapshots. Right? Because what happens when you take a VMware snapshot of a VVOL-based VM, it creates array-based snapshots. And modern array-based snapshots are not performance impacting to the source. And so when you create these snapshots, right, there isn't a performance slash latency penalty to that VM, like the, the Delta VMDK file-based snapshots with something like VMFS. Right, and so I can happily say a best practice for VVOLs and VMware is, yeah, use VMware snapshots, because they're not VMware snapshots anymore. No, they're completely independent. They're not that chain that you see in your standard VMware snapshots. They're on the array. The I.O. does not go through that path. That snapshot is just sitting there as a delta file or a differential pointer. The I.O. still goes back to the original VMDK. So you want a snapshot? Great. Take a snapshot. You want to copy a machine? You have a snapshot. Copy the snapshot. Put it on another one. There's your VM. You can use a lot of different functionality. And those can sit there, too, without that, oh, look, my snapshot keeps increasing, my performance goes down, that snapshot can sit there as long as you want. It doesn't matter. Because it's array-based snapshots, not VMware-level snapshots. And Cormac Hogan wrote a great blog post describing the changes um, around the redirection and stuff like that mm -hmm. with VVOL snapshots, the VMware snapshots. If you want for more info, check it out. It's, you know, Google VVOL snapshots. You'll find right. it. Yeah. All right. So, okay, if it's, if the Connectivity layer is divorced from the data store. How does this actually work? How are these volumes actually provisioned, right? So VMware leveraged something called an administrative logical unit, an ALU, and something called a subsidiary logical unit, an SLU. So uh, VMware gave a, a nice name to an ALU. They called it a protocol endpoint, right? The original name for it was an IOD multiplexer, but it sounded kind <laughs> of uh, back to the future-y, I think, so right. they, they, they removed that. Um, 
what actually happens here is that your volumes are connected through this protocol endpoint. So you provision a PE to a host one time, right? Uh, you connect it to a host, you rescan, fiber channel, whatever. And then as VMware needs volumes, you power on a VM, VMware goes to the array, hey, I need these four volumes. And they are connected through that ALU. All right, they're what's called a sublun. A VVOL, like the, the industry term for a VVOL really, is a sublun. So your protocol endpoint might be LUN ID 254, and your VVOL will be LUN ID 254 colon 7, 8, 9, 10, whatever. This allows a couple things. Only one rescan to see that PE. From that point on, no more SCSI bus rescans. Right, because if you had to do that every time you powered on a VM, we would all die in a storm of rescans, right? Because right. the rescans like, hey, everyone, tell me everything about everything, right? Um, and so this is say, hey, PE, I know this sublun's going to be here. Tell me about it, right? Very quick, very efficient. Right? When that VM's no longer needed, VMware removes those connections, so you no longer need to connect and disconnect volumes or create volumes, right? That's all done automatically. And that process is called a bind. That's what VMware refers to it. That sublun connection is called a bind. Removing it is called an unbind. So the I.O. goes to that PE, right? So the multipathing is done on that protocol endpoint, and that's it, right? You see eight logical paths or whatever for all the volumes on that array, right? All the VVOLs on that array, right? So you set your round robin, you set your MRU, whatever that happens to be on that particular protocol endpoint using the standard rules we talked about before, SATP, PSP, that doesn't change. You just have a lot less volumes to worry about this configuration in these settings. You have your protocol endpoint. So that leads to the question, how many PEs do I need? This is extremely array dependent. I think almost every vendor has different recommendations around this. Some say, hey, you know, two per host, four per cluster, ten per array, right? It's not um, one to one. It's not one to one. We saw some I had some customers try to do that, but you don't need to. Um, we, on our array here, we say one for the entire array, right? Everyone has different recommendations. So it really goes back to that same question, what's the performance profile? of a volume on that array of a PE. So talk to your vendor about those recommendations. The nice thing is once you provision it, you don't need to worry about connecting, disconnecting, anything like that. You provision them, VMware takes care of the rest along, alongside the, uh, the VOS provider of that particular array. And so that question is something that should be directed to your storage vendor. Now, once again, I'll get into more detail around this in a bit, um, but QDEP does come up. How does this work? The QDEP, the default QDEP for a protocol endpoint is much higher than what VMFS originally offered and can be set much, 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 much higher. All right? And so VMware by default allows a lot more concurrent I.O. to a protocol endpoint than it does to a particular VMFS. So VMware has opened this up from their side. Right? So then it goes down to, should I change these? What does my array support? And my last topic around here in a bit will be around queuing. Okay. So my favorite topic, I'll let you do it. All right. Second third topic. I'm only going to do a little bit of trim on map because I have a session tomorrow where John Nicholson and I are going to go pretty deep into trim and unmap. But one of the things Cody and I want to talk about is, and this actually came up as a, a GSS problem too, is I can't get unmap to work. Usually it has to do with what version do I have. And the no, people don't pay attention. They just hear, I hear trim on the map works. They go in and turn it on and nothing happens. You got to make sure that you have the correct version, whether it's your guest OS, right? Windows has to be hardware 11 or bigger. Linux, only supported when you get to it's 6.5, I believe. That has to be 13 or above. And then there's different versions within your vSphere, right? You have vSphere 6, 6.5, 6.7, and above, all have different features. So we can go into that a little bit. What works, 6.0, right? You've got just a few things. Then provisioning will work with Windows. And the VMware version, like I said, is 11. 6.5, we get quite a few more. That's when Linux came in. You can do it when CBT is enabled. Um, if unmaps are misaligned, it will work. What happens with that? Say you got a 4K block, you get a trim unmap that's maybe 3K. It will fill the difference with zeros and process the unmap. Before, that didn't happen. 6.7, again, more features added. CBT, unmap misaligned. With VMware snapshots, right? Now we can actually support doing unmap on thin provision VMs that have snapshots. It will now actually go into the SE sparse snapshot and reclaim storage. Again, my session tomorrow talks about this. 
Uh, we also now support the NVMe adapters. Still, thick disks are not supported. Now, I went through that pretty fast, again, because we're actually close on time already, and uh, tomorrow I have a session. So if you want to go in there, there is still a little bit of room. But we wanted to kind of touch on it because it is a problem and a pain point that GSS hears. So we just kind of did a highlight on that. Or I could use VVOLs and all this is nonsense. Yes. So, yeah, yeah. All right. so queuing, all right, this comes up quite a bit. And the reason I like to talk about it is because I don't think anyone should really have to deal with it for the most part. And because and, vendor practices, best practices rather do vary somewhat around this. In general, do I need to change my queue depth? So I'm just going to start off right now is most do not. The default configuration of ESX is plenty for most environments, right? That I think is fairly true. Yeah. Right, right. There's a few out there that might need to change it, but generally you do not. All right, so first off, what is a queue depth limit? Right, what does this actually mean? Because right, I think this is an important thing to understand when it comes to these recommendations. Should I change my queue depth? Should I not? Should I change DSNRO? All this type of stuff. All right, so let's look at it. It's like I have a grocery store. All right, if I have one checkout counter or one clerk active, they can do one customer at a time. All right, if you have any more customers trying to check out, they have to wait. Right? So in this, in this situation, right, I, I have a queue depth limit of one. Right? So anyone else has got to wait. And if they wait, they have a latency at that grocery store. Right? If I have two customers right, in line, or in two clerks, rather, I can serve two customers at the same time. Right? So if I have two, no one has to wait. Right? So I have a queue depth limit of two. Right? This is how many outstanding customers I can support at this, per, at this point in time. And that's essentially what a, a queue depth is inside of, inside of ESX or whatnot. Right? How many outstanding IOs does this layer of the path currently support? Because there are different layers inside of this, the storage queue and ESX. Right? But this is a good way to kind of, I think, visualize it. As I mentioned, there are different parts to this. Right? Your HBA or your software iSCSI adapter, right? it has a queue depth limit. The hypervisor also has its own method of control, and this is something referred to as DSNRO, or formerly known as DSNRO. Right. Um, there is a queue inside of your virtual SCSI adapter in your VM. There's also a queue depth limit for individual disks inside of that virtual SCSI adapter. Right. So the point is, like, if you're going to change one of these, right, you, you probably need to change them all. Right? If, if you have an exit lane or an entrance lane going to a highway and you make it 10 lanes, but the highway itself is still only two, where's the benefit? Right? It's like a river flowing down. Tributaries, right? if they feed into the large river and they're all way bigger, that river's going to overflow and everyone's going to drown. Right? Support organizations call opening up all the QDEPs on all the hosts the thundering herd, right? where all of a sudden everything's opened up and then bam, eventually you find your bottleneck in your sand or your network or whatnot. All right, so that's a good way to do some plumbing tests, I suppose, right? <laughs> um, for, for better. Let's see what breaks, and then we'll back worse. it up, right? So generally, the recommendation from inside the guest is the pair of virtual SCSI adapter. Now, VMware has added support for the NVMe adapter, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it seems to have similar performance profiles around it. Um, but at this point in time, most vendors still recommend the PV SCSI adapter. I think if you have internal NVMe inside of the uh, inside of the host, these recommendations can change, but generally for SAN storage, pair of virtual SCSI is still the recommended virtual SCSI nice. adapter from most SAN vendors that I can tell. Right? I try to read through all the best practice documentation before I, I, I do the session. Okay. And so there are certain values, there are certain default values, and there's two maximums there that should say default, default, um, not d default maximum, maximum, but I think you get the point. All right? So default virtual disk queue depth limit inside of PV SCSI is 64. The, the maximum adapter queue depth limit is 256, and both of those can be quadrupled, right, or the default. Right? And so if you need to push more performance out of a VM, you do need to up these values at a certain point. Right? Or you can parallelize, use multiple adapters, use multiple virtual disks. It really depends on what you're trying to do, but these things can be changed. Just simply adding the pair of virtual SCSI adapter is probably not going to change your performance profile that much. You might get better CPU utiliza utilization, Right? But it's not necessarily going to change your performance profile. All right. So <clears throat> with that note, um, let's go a little bit further down the stack. So there's also the HBA setting. Right? The HBA has a certain queue depth limit, and these varies, this varies depending on vendors and actually even on versions. I think queue logic changed theirs in 6.0 from 32 to 64. And you notice that this is lower than what the pair of virtual SCSI adapter supports. 
the PV SCSI adapter by default will let you push out more concurrent I.O. than the HBA will let you in most of these scenarios. And so even if you do push out all that I.O., you have that many outstanding I.O.s coming from a VM, they're just going to sit in the ASX kernel waiting for their time in that checkout line, right? And so when you make these changes, understand the stack, right? Understand the different parts of it, because changing in one place may or may not help you. Indeed, it could hurt you, depending on what, where you make that change. Right. So changing, changing your HBA settings are generally set through ESX CLI. Um, now, they do require a reboot, right, if you want to make this setting in the HBA, right, from ESX CLI. So it does require a reboot. It's not something you can just change. Uh, and there's a good KB article that kind of walks through these and so forth. And these will be, this slide deck will be posted and all that kind of stuff. So um, you can find these links later. So <clears throat> this is where things get confusing, um, the hypervisor level QDEP limits. This is the setting formerly known as disk.schedule number requests outstanding, the SNRO. Right, that used to be a host-wide setting, is now a per-device setting. And this is a hypervisor level enforced QDEP limit. Your actual QDEP limit for a given device is going to be the minimum of DSNRO and the HBA QDEP limit. So if you set DSNRO to 256, but your HBA is still set to 32, your actual QDEP limit is 32. Right? VMware has a setting in here to enforce commonality across your storage, right? So you're not getting all kinds of different things depending on this, on this HBA and that HBA and so forth. Right? Both of these things can be changed. DSNRO can be changed online, um, but once again, it does depend on the HBA QDEP. In 6.5 and later, VMware will not let you set DSNRO any higher than the QDEP limit of that HBA for that given device. They do enforce that, at least in the CLI. But I've heard some rumblings that there's a ways of getting around that in the API, apparently. Don't try and get around it. Yeah, we were talking about that earlier. Remember that, <laughs> that, that forcing over, right? You set it to 256 and your HBA is only 32. You're going to overrun, you potentially could overrun that. So the default QDEP limit of VMFS and RDMs is 32. Effectively, right? Because that's what DSNRO is set to by default. Right? And so that can be changed and that can be increased. It can now, one of the changes in 6.5 is that it can be increased beyond 256. It can actually be increased to whatever that HBA QDEP limit is set to. And right? I think you can max out the iSCSI adapter to 2048 or something, you know, super high. Right? Protocol endpoints have a different default setting. This is a host wide setting and a per, per device setting. So you can change it if you want to, real no reason to. The default QDEP limit for protocol endpoint is 128, and as I mentioned before, that can go up to 4,096. You can either override that default by changing that value, or you can individually override it on a per PE basis, which is probably the recommended option if for some reason you decide you need to do that. Okay, <clears throat> so let's, let's make this sound a little bit more realistic. All right, what, is this, what does this mean? What does this QDEP limit mean in terms of IOPS and so forth? And I'll give you an example here, um, and, you know, you can certainly read this and I'll, I'll walk this in a second, but how are we on time here? Going okay. Okay. Um, if I'm at the grocery store and it takes, there is one checkout counter and it takes me one minute to get through it, I can do 60 customers in an hour, right, if they're continually going through. So my latency is a minute, my IOPS, right, is 60 per hour, right? And this is the same thing when it comes to QDEPs inside of the storage, right? If you know your average latency, right, or at least you can kind of guess it, and like if you're using like an all flash array in general, like it's gonna be less than a, a millisecond, right? So you can kind of ballpark it enough to kind of get an idea. If my average latency is a half a millisecond and my QDEP limit is one, I can do 2,000 IOPS, right? 2,000 half milliseconds in a second. If it's 32, I can do 64,000 IOPS. That's 64,000 IOPS per data store per host. Who in here is pushing more than that on average? One or two, and that's pretty much yeah. what we see. And that, in your environment, right, you might want to change this. Everyone else is probably okay, because remember, this is per host per data store, right? Protocol endpoints default to 128. Right, so bam, 256,000 IOPS at a half millisecond latency. Now, of course, if your average latency is much higher than that, this math changes a little bit. But if your average latency is that much higher, your array might be stressed, and do I really want to open up my QDEP limits? I don't know, right, once again, think about it, talk to your vendor, understand your, your performance profile and your storage, and then think about making these changes. Because frankly, if you make these changes, you gotta make it on every host, you wanna make it the same. If you vMotion a VM from one host to another, you don't want a different performance profile. 
right? Keeping things consistent is important. So make a decision around this. Some customers I've seen have a high performance compute cluster. This cluster, I change it. The other ones, I keep it as it is, right? Just think through it, right? I don't think you should blanket change these values unless you need to, right? Don't break what isn't broken. All right. Or what isn't recommended. Yeah, indeed. So uh, real quickly here, storage DRS and storage IO control. Um, right, storage DRS will move VMs around depending on capacity usage and also performance. Right, storage IO control will throttle different VMs. And I'm simple a little bit, but we'll throttle certain VMs based on the performance profile of a data store. I think the key point here is what latencies these things react to. Right? The minimum value is five milliseconds. All right, so in general, for all flash arrays, it's not really going to be particularly useful, but you, know, you never know. Right? But the main point here, storage DRS takes into account queuing inside of ESX. And so if your queue depth limit is set too low and your VMs are trying to push a lot of performance and therefore their latency is going to increase, storage DRS will see, oh, yeah, they have maybe a half a millisecond on the array, but they have seven milliseconds added in the kernel. I'm going to move this over here because that doesn't have that queuing problem. Storage DRS can react to that. Storage I.O. control is not about the kernel. It's about is this disk or flash volume, is it stressed? It ignores latency above the data store. It only looks at what is the disk average latency, right, the array and the SAN and back of this particular volume, and that's what it reacts to. Right, so you might have storage ERS do something, but storage I control doesn't. Why? They're looking at different values. One quick thing on the storage I.O. control, SIOC, there's now two versions. 6.5, we announced another one called V2. They are different. Storage I.O. V1 is exactly what Cody was saying. It looks at the data store itself. Storage I.O. V2 is a policy-based storage I.O. control, and it can be done at a device level. So you can apply an SPBM with SIO V2 to a VM or a single disk in a VM. So keep that in mind. And they can be used together or independently. OK, and so we're, we're running a little low on time here, so we need to get through these last slides. We're almost done. Um, last thing about VVOLs and QDEP, as I mentioned, right, that QDEP limit is set on the PE, not the VVOL data store. So you don't need to multiply VVOL data store's performance. It's really a question around protocol endpoints. Right. So let's talk about the last thing, is just some basic troubleshooting recommendations. Take it away. Finish yeah, up. so we'll go through this. The key here is that what we want you guys to do is build your repertoire of tools that you can use to use your environment. ESX top is great. You, I usually have a window open that's just running on a lot of hosts. It just, there's a lot of things in there that you can see what's going on. Latency, you can monitor unmap now with 6.7. CPU, memory, all these things are things that you need to keep an eye on, especially storage. And within storage, you've got disk, you've got controllers, and you've got VM. So you've got three different areas that you can look and start seeing where is my performance problem. Uh, another one, you've got vRealize. Log Inside is another one that's really nice. Um, there's some pretty neat features, kind of seeing history, maybe seeing spikes when you're not around, figuring out that, oh, this happened at the same time every day. And that's kind of handy, because then you might say, what's going on during that specific time that doesn't happen the rest of the time? The VOMA, this is to help you go in and look at actual VMFS metadata. This is really going in pretty deep, but this tool is available and allows you to kind of really read and find out if there's some VMFS issues. Go to VVOLs, it works better. Uh, customer improvement, no, customer experience improvement program. Before 6.5, this was opt in. With 6.5 and above, it's opt out. If you have you can go in and check this. It's under uh, administration, and then it actually says CEIP. What this does is start sending data to GSS. It's all obfuscated, so you don't, none of your hosts or IPs or anything can be seen by anybody. But when you call, right, typically if you call with a GSS problem, they're like, okay, send me your logs. If you've got CEIP, they already have all that data. And it also helps us with monitoring problems. We start seeing oh, look, all of these different customers are having the same problem. That's something we need to look at. So check that, see if that's enabled. We recommend that that's enabled. Go into your graph, start looking at things, right? Another one that happens, this isn't somewhat storage related, but we see some people that add too many cores to a host. Go in and see if your wait state is too high. See if it's waiting for a core to be available. I saw an exchange administrator that had put 
32 cores on a host and the, C the CPU wait state was through the roof. And I said, you have too many cores. He's like, no, 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 this is what the recommender vendor said. And I said, trust me, have that and you'll get better performance. He would not believe me. Finally, it went down. We changed it and he couldn't believe the performance increase he got by reducing the number of CPUs. Because remember, it's got to wait for all those cores to be scheduled at the same time. Storage. Look at it at different views, right? You've got a data store view. You've got a host view. You've got a VM view. Make sure you look at those in those different areas because you might see extreme latency on a VM level, and on the data store, you're not seeing any latency. So that might give you an indication of where you need to start looking for a problem. <clears throat> ESX top, again, this is a beautiful tool, super standard. You can use the RESX top remotely or just log in and launch that. Right, just at the right time, here's the present. Everything in this session and more has been put on this static web page. Who likes this idea? Okay, so I'm really pushing to have all of the sessions, at least within the storage area, to start doing this. Because when we come here and everybody wants to learn and like, oh wow, he talked about so many things, this has everything in this session and more on one static page. It's static. It's not going to change. You can use it as a reference. Thank you. Cool. Thank you guys very Thank much. You. Sorry we went that was long. Thank you very much. We'll if you be have out, any we'll questions, be we'll come out here. We'll be out front if you want questions. Sorry we took so long. He got me started on VVOLs. It's all his fault. Right, so. yeah. All right. Thanks.